Hello everyone. Welcome to the lecture 5 on the series on excretory physiology. So in the last class we had discussed about uh, the urine formation in that we had discussed about the step 1 that is the glomerular filtration. So today in this class we are going to discuss about the second and the third process which is the tubular reabsorption and tubular secretion. So here the movement of the substances in case of reabsorption and secretion whatever the substances that is there in the lumen of the tubules it has to cross number one the epithelial cells and it has to cross the endothelial barrier to enter inside the blood. So it is a two step process. So first whatever the substances that is there should enter inside the epithelial cell then it has to go into the blood. Even in case of secretion, the substances that are present in the blood has to go to the epithelial cell, then from the epithelial cell it has to enter into the lumen. So here, the endothelial cells of the peritubular capillaries are fenestrated and they offer no resistance for the movement of water and also the small solutes. So this is an advantage that we are having so that the small solutes and the water can easily get inside to the peritubular capillaries then it can go into the general circulation. And also if you see, so if you take this as an afferent arteriole. So then it gives rise to glomerulus, then to the efferent arteriole, then you do get the peritubular capillaries. So in the peritubular capillaries, if you see for the hydrostatic pressure, the hydrostatic pressure is always decreased. So as the blood enters via the efferent arteriole, when it reaches the glomerulus, so you we have seen that there is increased hydrostatic pressure in the glomerulus and this increased hydrostatic pressure helps in filtration process. Whereas when the remaining blood when it passes through the efferent arteriole the hydrostatic pressure goes on decreasing. So in the peritubular capillaries the hydrostatic pressure is decreased and you can also see the colloidal osmotic pressure also gets increased. That is whenever the blood flows through the efferent arteriole, whenever there is glomerular filtration, we have seen that many of the particles are filtered except for larger proteins and also for the formed elements. So here the presence of larger proteins when it passes to the efferent arteriole and it when it passes to the peritubular capillaries these larger proteins will especially the albumin gives for the osmotic pressure and there is increased osmotic pressure in the peritubular capillaries. So this decreased hydrostatic pressure and increased colloidal osmotic pressure always favors your reabsorption in peritubular capillaries. Whereas the decreased osmotic pressure and the increased hydrostatic pressure always favor the filtration in the glomerular capillaries. And this reabsorption or secretion process is easier in case of cortex. As you already know the cortex is made up of glomeruli and all convoluted tubules. So as the glomerulus and the peritubular capillaries are fenestrated, so many of the peritubular capillaries are also seen in the cortex therefore the movements of the particles or the substances are easier in case of cortex. That means to say the events that are occurring in the epithelial cell will determine the movement of the particles. 
that is if the epithelial barrier is permeable for certain substances then it can easily pass into the peritubular capillaries if it is in the cortex but in case of medulla of the kidney the movement of the substances is somewhat complicated it is complicated because number 1 the blood supply to the parts deep into the medulla is always lesser so we have seen vasa recta in case of long looped nephrons which will supply to the loop of henle so the blood supply is lesser than compared to the structures that are present in the cortex number 1 number 2 as we already also seen that compared to that of the peritubular capillaries vasa recta is less fenestrated so we have seen that only the ascending part of the vasa recta is fenestrated so in case of medulla it is the activity or the reabsorption depends upon the activity of the epithelial cell and also the events that are occurring in the endothelium so both plays an important role whenever there is reabsorption from the medullary region whereas in case of cortex it is determined by the events that are taking in tubular epithelium and also in case of medulla the osmolarity also changes so we'll discuss in the future classes how the osmolarity changes from cortex to that of the medulla so there is an increased osmolarity deep inside the medulla which is maintained so therefore the movement of the substances is somewhat complicated in case of medulla than compared to that of the cortex now coming for the general principles how the substances crosses the epithelium so the crossing of the epithelium that is the epithelial cells of the tubules can be of by two routes one is referred to be as paracellular route the other is called transcellular route so paracellular route is that route where the substances move through the tight junctions in between the two epithelial cells so if you take this as a one epithelial cell and this is a second epithelial cell so we have discussed in detail whenever we have discussed the tubules they are made up of single layer of epithelial cells and in between each epithelial cell there is a tight junction and in this junction if the particles move if the substances move then it is referred to be as paracellular route the other important route is referred to be as transcellular so it enters through the apical surface then it goes via the basolateral surface so for the better understanding the epithelium can be divided into two surfaces the apical surface is the one which will always faces the lumen so this is the tubular room lumen so this will be the apical surface and the basolateral surface will be facing the endothelium so if this is the endothelium so this will be the interstitial space so this will be the interstitial space so from the interstitial space it enters into the blood so if it is this is a blood vessel or if it is a uh, peritubular capillaries so from the lumen for example if there is a sodium here first the sodium enters through the apical surface then it goes inside a cell then it comes out through the basolateral surface then it enters inside the blood so this way of crossing is referred to be as transcellular so we do have paracellular and transcellular mode of transmission so if you are now we'll discuss some of the general mechanisms in which the substances are reabsorbed before going to the proper tubular reabsorption and secretion so coming for the first 
uh, we can say the method or the mechanism through which there will be movement of the particles or the substances is the movement by diffusion. So what does diffusion mean? It is a random movement of the free molecules in a solution. So then the substances will move randomly and the diffusion occurs if the barrier is permeable. This is most important. Second, there should be a driving force for the diffusion. So what is a driving force for the diffusion? It may be a concentration gradient. It may be a concentration gradient or it may be a potential gradient. So if there is a membrane, if this membrane is permeable to sodium, if the sodium is more in this area, for example, there is more of sodium. So if the sodium is less here, so it will easily diffuse because there is a concentration or the potential gradient. Therefore, the sodium will move easily here. So this way of a movement or the mechanism of the movement of the substance is referred to be as diffusion and in case of kidney most of the substances crossing the endothelial barrier that is here so whenever they come out through the basolateral surface whenever they are in the interstitial space from the interstitial space whenever they are going to the through the endothelium into the peritubular capillaries many of the substances will cross through the diffusion by this fashion and many or all lipid soluble substances like carbon dioxide, blood gases, lipids, steroids will move through diffusion. So as it is made up of lipid bilayer, so carbon dioxide can easily move via these layers. So this process of movement is called as diffusion again it is a passive process there is no need of energy however there is in need of a driving force that is a concentration or a potential gradient the second way by which the transmission or the movement of the substances can occur is through the channels So many substances which cannot penetrate the lipid membrane. So you know a cell is made up of a lipid bilayer. So many of the substances cannot penetrate the lipid membrane. Therefore, there are specific integral membrane proteins that are found on the cell membrane. Those are called channels or transporters these are the specific proteins that are found on the cell membrane which carries those substances inside a cell which cannot penetrate the cell membrane so what are these channels these channels are the small tiny holes or the pores they will permit water or specific solutes to diffuse upon for example, we do have what is called a sodium channel, we do have potassium channel. Again, the movement of the substances is passive here, there is no need of energy. For example, we do have aquaporins. Aquaporins are nothing but the water channels that are present which allow the water to diffuse. Here, a large amount of specific substances flows which would otherwise slowly diffuse. The advantage over the diffusion and having a channel is that in the process of a simple diffusion, the movement of the substances is slower. If there is a presence of a channel, the same movement of the substances will be faster and more amount of the substances, a larger amount of a specific substance can flow in an increased amount inside a cell. So here in various, for example, when we discussed about the neuronal physiology, when we discussed about the action potential generation in the heart, we have seen how the sodium channels 
works whenever there is a opening up of the sodium channel a large amount of sodium enters inside a cell which helps in the creation of action potential so this channels uh, they are gated that means they are closed and they open up due to specific signals if they open up because of the presence of a ligand then it is called as a ligand gated channel if they open up due to the voltage then it is called as a voltage gated channel if they open due to the mechanical uh, for example stretch then they are referred to be as mechanically gated channels the second type that we can see in a cell is referred to be as a transporters the transporters here the binding is stronger and specific however they are highly regulated than the channels and the rate of transport is low when compared to the channel but they are stronger and highly regulated than the channels they are similar to that of the channels however it is stronger and regulated so there are two types of channels or the transporters that can be classified number one is called uniporters uniporter is that type of a transporter which help in the movement of only one or a single solute if they help in the transportation of only one single solute then it is called as a uniporter the movement here is also referred to be as facilitated diffusion facilitated diffusion for example you do have what is called glut glut or glucose transporters glucose transporters they help in the transportation of only glucose which are present in the proximal convoluted tube they are present in the basolateral membrane so here in the basolateral membrane we do have the glucose transmitters so what is the difference between a uniporter and a channel so channel is a tiny hole whereas a uniporter it requires a solute to bind to a site that is alternately available to one side and then other side of the membrane so you do have two binding site so that is the uniporters have two binding site one which can bind to the one side of a membrane the other to the other side of the membrane so the second classification of the transporters are symporters symporters are the one which will help in the movement of two or more solutes in the movement of two or more solutes so here the solutes can move in the same direction the two solutes can move for example this is a one solute this is a second it can move in a same direction then that is referred to be as co-transporters they are also called symporters or co-transporters or they can be movement in a different direction one can enter inside a cell the other solute can come outside of a cell then it is called anti porter or it is also called counter transporter counter transporter counter or anti porter it's a co or symporter where the movement of the substances is in a same direction or in a opposite direction for example we do have sodium glucose transporters sglt sodium glucose transporters these are the best example for co transporters or symporters where the movement is in the same direction that is whenever the sodium moves glucose also moves together so one glucose is carried for either one or two sodium so antiporter sodium hydrogen exchangers 
so whenever the sodium enters inside of a cell hydrogen goes out of a cell then it is called counter transporter or anti transporters so if this symporters or the antiporters if it uses the atp for the movement of the substances then it is called active transport or it is a primary active transport for example your sodium potassium atp pump so sodium potassium atp pump is the one which will pump three sodium out and it will help in the two potassium in movement so this requires atp so this is an active transport or there are calcium atp bases hydrogen atp bases etc which are the primary active transport if the same antiporter or a symporter if does not hydrolyze atp however it utilizes or uses indirectly the energy provided by the primary active transport then it is called secondary active transport so how to explain this for example so in the baso so this is the baso lateral membrane this is the apical surface baso lateral surface and the apical surface so in the baso lateral surface we do have sodium potassium atp pump so we do have three sodium going out and two potassium three sodium and two potassium coming in in the expenditure of energy that is hydrolyzation of atp so whenever this happens so this is an primary active transport so whenever this happens the concentration of sodium inside the cell decreases so what happens here sodium whenever it is more in the lumen so this is the lumen so whenever the sodium is more here this sodium is drawn inside because of the concentration gradient so whenever the sodium moves it also takes glucose with it so along with the sodium it also takes glucose so this is the best example for sodium glucose transporters this it does not utilize atp directly but it has utilized indirectly the energy that is utilized by the primary active transport so here it actively transported by using atp but because of this there was decreased sodium and the sodium will move from outside to that of the inside of a cell along with the sodium glucose also moves so this is an example for secondary active transport whereas in case of secondary active transport there is no direct utilization of atp however it utilizes indirectly the energy that was provided by the primary active transport and the third way by which the substances can move is referred to be as receptor mediated endocytosis where certain of the substances are internalized inside a cell so if the substances are present here they make an endocytic vesicle and they are taken as such so they are internalized as a vesicle then they are degraded so the they will be acted upon by the lysosomes that is the and they will be degraded inside that of a cell and the remaining substances can be moved out for example we do have insulin so whenever the insulin hormone is seen in the lumen so it will be internalized and it will be degraded and it will be broken down into constituent amino acids these amino acids will move out of a cell the most important is what is referred to be as transcytosis process 
where the internalized particles are not degraded here so they are not degraded instead they are exocytosed as such how they are internalized in the same way they are exocytosed in a intact fashion this is most important for the transport of the immunoglobulins so the immunoglobulins are transcytosed in this fashion so these were the basic mechanisms through which there will be a tubular uh, there will be reabsorption or the secretion process in any part of the body so these same principles will hold good in the kidney also for the reabsorption and the secretion processes so we'll see in specific how the reabsorption and the secretion process will be seen in different segments of the tubules so the basic mechanism is whenever there is the blood is coming from the efferent arteriole it goes through the glomerulus in the glomerulus there is fenestrate then it passes through the gbm glomerular basement membrane then through the slit diaphragms then all the substances will be filtered because of the increased hydrostatic pressure so once the things are filtered we have seen all those substances which are less than 7000 daltons are freely filtered positively ions are freely filtered however there is no filtration of larger proteins formed elements etc so then it passes through the the first part of the tubule that is the pct or the proximal convoluted tubule so here in the bowman space those filtered fluid are called glomerular filtrate so when it passes to through the pct it is referred to be as tubular fluid it is referred to be as tubular fluid so in the pct the osmolarity of the tubular fluid is similar to 300 milli osmoles per liter because many of the substances are in similar concentration to that of the plasma except for the formed elements and also for the larger proteins so in the proximal convoluted tubule it is all made up of a single layer of epithelial cells which has got a microvilli on the apical surface so this increases the area for reabsorption therefore in the pct majority of the substances are absorbed or reabsorbed in the proximal convoluted tubules so if you see the list of the substances number 1 glucose so glucose is very much essential to the body therefore they are absorbed reabsorbed 100% and the way of reabsorption is sodium glucose co-transporters so sodium glucose transporters so by now you know what do you mean by co-transporters what do you mean by transporters and this is an example for secondary active transport amino acids which are filtered are 100% reabsorbed by sodium amino acid co-transporters sodium is reabsorbed to 65% in the pct and it is by the active mechanism potassium is reabsorbed to about again 65% through diffusion and mainly by the paracellular route you have seen you know now what do you mean by the paracellular route it is a movement through the tight junctions in between the two cells chloride about 50% it is through the diffusion or the paracellular route calcium and the magnesium it varies and it again through the paracellular route water which is very much is reabsorbed up to 65% by osmosis and this is most important if you see the percentage reabsorption of the water to that of the percentage reabsorption of the sodium is similar it is 65% 
so what will be the amount of reabsorption of the sodium the water also follows it is obliged to follow the sodium therefore this is called obligatory water reabsorption Obli it is obliged to follow the sodium or a solute therefore it is referred to as obligatory water reabsorption smaller proteins and the hormones they are reabsorbed through endocytosis we have seen just now phosphates they are reabsorbed up to 85% but remember the hormone parathyroid hormone will act on the proximal convoluted tubule where they will inhibit the reabsorption of phosphate bicarbonates they are reabsorbed up to 80 to 90% it is with sodium urea is reabsorbed up to 50% through the diffusion process so if you see major reabsorption will be seen in the proximal convoluted tubule now coming for the secretion processes so h plus ions are secreted ammonium and h4 is secreted creatinine which is a waste product after muscle metabolism is secreted bile salts and uh, drugs any drugs uric acid is secreted in case of proximal convoluted tubule now if you look at the mechanisms by which these substances are reabsorbed to explain so we already know so this is the peritubular capillaries peritubular capillary so i am taking two sides here these are also the peritubular capillaries so this is the lumen so this after filtration the fluid moves through the lumen of which is lined by cells of the proximal convoluted tubule so here you can see the tubular fluid so it is a lumen so these are the epithelial cells of the pct so this is the apical surface so this is the baso lateral surface baso lateral surface this is the interstitium interstitium so in the baso lateral surface of the proximal convoluted tubule cells or the epithelial cells there is presence of sodium potassium atp is pump sodium potassium atp is pump so there will be pumping out of three sodium to that of two potassium using atp so it is a primary active transport so whenever there is transport of these the sodium inside decreases so whatever the sodium that is there in the tubular fluid is moved inside that of a cell through the apical surface so whenever the sodium moves it can also take glucose can also take glucose so this is an example for co transporters secondary active transport through the apical surface through symporter or co transporters and or there are other transporters that are present which can take sodium along with the sodium the amino acids can also enter amino acids can also enter through these cells so this is an example for sodium amino acid co transporters or it can also take sodium along with the sodium it can also take the chloride so this is an example for sodium chloride co transporter sodium chloride co transporter so in this way whatever the glucose or the sodium that is present in the tubular fluid is passed inside the epithelial cells so once inside the epithelial cells they pass the baso lateral membrane for example in the baso lateral membrane we do have glutes 
so what are glut glut are the glucose transporters so whatever the glucose that is present here will attach here and it will be thrown out to the here to the interstitial space through the interstitial space there is fenestrae and it can easily move inside the blood vessels in the similar fashion we do have transporters for the amino acids in the basolateral substances then it can move inside the endothelial cells even the sodium you do have the sodium channels potassium channels chloride channels so they can move easily through these channels through the basolateral membrane and they can enter inside the endothelial cells so it's a two way transporters it should transport from the tubular fluid in the lumen it will be transported through the co transporter systems then from the basolateral membrane through the transporters that are specific that is the uni, uh, uniporters or the gated channels then it will move into the endothelial or inside the blood capillaries or the blood vessels via the fenestrae so many um, the water water can move through the uh, by the osmotic process i have already stated the amount of sodium it, it is taken so water that is present here can also be transported through the obligatory water reabsorption by the osmotic process and your calcium magnesium all this can pass through the paracellular route so this is the junction between these two so it is a paracellular route it can be transported and we have already seen small proteins and the hormones can be endocytosed as an endocytic vesicle it will be degraded into specific amino acids and there are specific transporters for amino acids therefore they can move inside the blood vessels phosphates we have already stated it is 85% reabsorbed by the uh, and it will be inhibited by the pth urea by the diffusion now the most important point to be noted here is the reabsorption of uh, bicarbonates so whenever uh, the carbon dioxide that is present here can enter inside a cell so carbon dioxide can easily enter inside a cell because it is a it can cross the lipid bilayer so it can diffuse inside a cell so inside a cell it will combine with the water and it forms h2co3 the carbonic acid in the presence of the enzyme carbonic anhydrase so carbonic anhydrase catalyzes this reaction to be faster and this will dissociate itself to h plus and hco3 minus now this hydrogen will move inside the lumen and in exchange for it sodium will be taken inside so it is a counter transporter so that i had talked about nhe sodium hydrogen exchanges so this hydrogen will be secreted back to the tubular fluid and sodium will be taken inside so this hydrogen can react with the hco3 that is present in the fluid so hco3 was present in the tubular fluid so the hydrogen which is formed by this reaction can react with the hco3 it can form h2co3 which will be degraded into hydrogen and carbon dioxide hyd water sorry water and carbon dioxide water will be thrown out through in the tubular fluid and it goes for the excretion carbon dioxide will move in this fashion so indirectly the bicarbonates are thrown out by this reaction so what happens to this bicarbonates this bicarbonate can move inside the blood vessel during the 
acidosis condition for example if there is metabolic acidosis if there is increased h plus ions here so hco3 can move in this fashion so it can buffer or it can makes the acidosis to turn out to be towards the normal the ph can be maintained towards the normal side so coming for the next part the loop of henle so the loop of henle has got two different portions one is the descending limb and the ascending limb so here the descending limb is permeable to water so about 50 15% of the water is reabsorbed by the osmotic process and there are specialized channels for the water reabsorption referred to as aquaporins especially the type 1 so here there are type 1 aquaporins which helps in the reabsorption of water or it is permeable to the water there so the ascending limb in the ascending limb for about 20 to 25% of the sodium 20% of the potassium and 30% of the chloride is taken back or it is reabsorbed in the presence of sodium potassium two chloride co-transporter system so again coming back here to explain so this is the apical surface this is the basolateral surface so we do have the lumen here so here we are getting a fluid so in the ascending limb we do have a co-transporter system which takes sodium inside to vessel potassium inside to vessel and two chloride inside to vessel that of a cell and from the basolateral surface towards the interstitium it comes out through the sodium channel potassium channel and chloride channels so here so in the interstitium you can see sodium potassium and the chloride so the calcium and the magnesium is variable it depends it, it the mostly it is by the paracellular route and the most important point to be remembered the ascend ascending limb is impermeable to the water so therefore in the proximal convoluted tube so before this we got the pct so in the proximal convoluted tube the osmolarity was 300 milliosmoles so which is similar to that of the blood or the plasma therefore we call it as isotonic isotonic so it is similar to that of the plasma so when the fluid moves through the descending limb in the descending limb the water is reabsorbed and the remaining is only the solute therefore it becomes hypertonic hyper tonic there is increased in the osmolality so how much it can reach it can reach anywhere from 1200 to 2800 milli osmoles we'll see how it reaches later on so when the again the fluid moves through the ascending limb here water is impermeable but what moves out is the solute so the solute concentration decreases so it becomes hypotonic again hypo there is a decrease in the osmolality when compared to that of the plasma whereas in the descending limb it is hypertonic it is increased whereas in the pct it is similar to that of the plasma that is the or the blood that is isotonic so coming to the distal convoluted tubule so in the distal convoluted tubule about 5% of the sodium is reabsorbed by using sodium chloride co-transporters and the main point is the calcium reabsorption by the action of parathyroid hormone so the parathyroid hormone will act on the dct and it helps in the reabsorption of calcium so in the in this phenomena can be seen in the early part of distal convoluted tubule 
whereas in the late part of the distal convoluted tubule there will be sodium reabsorption and the potassium excretion in the presence of the hormone aldosterone so in the last class in the lecture 2 i had explained whenever we discussed about the tubule of the kidney up to the distal convoluted tubule each segment has got a specific cells for that segment so later part of the distal convoluted tubule and in the collecting ducts there are two separate cells that are formed one is referred to be as the principal cells the other is the intercalated cell it can be intercalated a cell and intercalated b cells so here the aldosterone will act on the principal cells and the help in the sodium reabsorption and also on the potassium excretion there so in the collecting ducts the principal cells of the collecting ducts helps in water reabsorption and also in the urea reabsorption remember the principal cells there will be water reabsorption and the urea reabsorption in the presence of adh so anti diuretic hormone is essential to be acted on the principal cells for the water reabsorption and urea reabsorption in the collecting duct so what they do so what is adh adh is an hormone which is released from the supraoptic nucleus of the hypothalamus it is synthesized and it will be stored in the posterior pituitary so in the blood physiology we had discussed about the adh thirst system so they will be released whenever the plasma osmolarity increases so this adh will act on the principal cells and this adh what does it will do it will create a aquaporin so this aquaporin is called aquaporin 2 so we had seen in the the aquaporin 1 which helps in the reabsorption of the water in the descending limb here in the principal cells a new aquaporins are formed in the presence of the adh in the principal cells principal cells that is called as aquaporin 2 which helps in the reabsorption of water in the similar fashion under the influence of the adh there will be ut1 receptors which or ut1 or the urea transporters which helps in the urea reabsorption which helps in the urea reabsorption in the later or in the collecting ducts so this is the importance of principal cells so principal cells number 1 helps in the sodium reabsorption and potassium excretion in the presence of aldosterone it will help in the water reabsorption in the presence of aquaporin 2 under the influence of the hormone adh number 3 it helps in the urea reabsorption in the presence of ut by the ut1 under the influence of adh now coming for the intercalated cells so intercalated a cells intercalated a cells plays an important role during acidosis during acidosis so whenever the ph is decreased so ph is normally maintained by 7.35 to 7.45 whenever there is decrease in the ph less than 7.2 or 7.25 we call it as acidosis 
So this, whenever there is acidosis, kidney plays an important role to correct the acidosis process in which intercalated A cells is being utilized. So what happens? The carbon dioxide enters inside a cell which will go the hydration reaction in the presence of carbonic anhydrase forms H2CO3. This will be H plus and HCO3 minus. So this H plus ions go will be secreted out to the lumen. So this is the lumen. H plus ions will go out. So here instead of so whenever one H plus ions is taken there is inward movement of potassium. Potassium. So there is excretion of H plus ions which is most important during acidosis and whatever the HCO3 that is formed will go into the blood. So it is a base which goes to the blood to decrease the, to increase the pH. So in this fashion it helps in the maintenance of the blood pH where intercalate So in intercalated B cell, which plays an important role during alkalosis, so whenever there is an increased pH, so the same reaction for example H2O plus CO2, H2CO3 carbonic acid, HCO3 and H plus. Instead of taking the HCO3, they will take hydrogen. So the HCO3 is brought back to the lumen. So it is thrown out to the lumen for the exchange with chloride. So HCO3 minus is thrown back and H plus is taken back to the cell. So in this fashion the intercalated B cells helps in the alkalosis and intercalated A cell during the acidosis.